Okay, I think we'll start. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks very much for joining us all. Uh, whatever time it is where you are, it's um, 5 p.m. for me here in the UK. I think it will be 11 a.m. for those of you in Central and midday on the East Coast and the beginning of the morning for anybody who's joining us on Pacific time. It's great to have you all with us. Um, I'm Adrian Salmon. I'm um, Vice President at GGNA and I specialize in annual giving. And I'm delighted to have with me today Mary Ann McCulloch, uh, who's Director of Annual Giving at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Mary Ann's been at Carnegie Mellon for just over 10 years. Uh, and um, always in uh, a, a, in a fundraising role, and for the last four years as director of the annual giving team at Carnegie Mellon University. And um, I've been um, it's been a wonderful experience to work with Mary Ann and her team. Uh, and uh, through that, I got to see uh, the incredible results that they've been getting over the past few years with their Giving Tuesday. Um, which they have reimagined uh, as giving CMU Day and uh, made into a runaway success. And uh, obviously now the question is, in 2020, um, how to reimagine that. So Mary Ann is uh, keen to stress, I think, that uh, she doesn't have all the answers, but has been very generous in willing to come and share her process and how she's thinking through it. Uh, with us today. Um, so Damien, if you could uh, let me uh, share the screen, I will, um, I will start us off. Um, so, so this is um, giving CMU Day by the numbers from 2016 up till 2020. And, and as you'll see, it's been an extraordinary journey at Carnegie Mellon, starting off in uh, 2016 with just under 1,400 donors and $333,000, all the way up to the most recent set of results for uh, last December, where the university raised nearly 1.2 million from nearly 5,000 donors. So Mary Ann, you know, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the story behind this success? I mean, I can see that there's one clear inflection point between 2017 and 2018 where uh, you you went up to over $500,000. And what was driving that? Well, good morning. It's great. I'm very pleased that we've been invited to uh, discuss this topic here today because it has been an amazing situation at CMU. Every year we challenge ourselves, as all institutions do, to do bigger and better. And I am really proud to say that the community globally has stepped up for CMU to deliver these types of results. And specific to your question, um, the changes that we have made have always been based on post-event reviews, identifying what's working and what isn't. And between 17 and 18, we had a situation where we changed our student match. In one of our challenges mm -hmm. in 17, we offered two to one match for students. And if they did make a gift, um, all the way up to $25 would be given to the student experience fund. And it was just for undergrad students. And we got mm -hmm momentum. But the next year in 18, we changed that. We went back to give from your heart, which is a theme at CMU historically. And we let students have a match of one to one from the office of the president to any fund at the university, including their student organizations. And we increased the audience to include graduate students. And it mm -hmm. was amazing to see the results that popped into place. And it's just built yeah. historically year after year. 
That's fantastic. And um, for the benefit of the audience, I mean, the, the aim of giving CMU Day for you at Carnegie Mellon has always been about engaging the student and grad student and, uh, you know, the, what one might call the other audiences in annual giving, hasn't it? Yes. One of the challenges we're facing this year is the students will not be on campus because historically, mm -hmm. We were very active with CMU Day beginning at midnight with an event where students would come to the Student Center for one hour and participate, become engaged, get educated about what Giving Tuesday was, and make their gifts, and win the opportunity to identify a fund that the prize money could go to from different challenges we had in the evening. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be able to do that, nor are we going to be able to table at various locations around campus. No. Students simply won't. Um, yeah. With our other audiences, we continue to build challenges. And just as we found success with students, we were able to create a parent match in FY19. And it was mm -hmm. amazing the number of parents that stepped up in order to unlock a uh, challenge to students or the parents. And is that what's growing the donors here in FY19? It's those extra parent donors that are coming yes. in. So it and leaps up from 1,400 to 3,500 donors. We also had the opportunity that the colleges began to embrace what we were doing. And they mm -hmm. started supporting. And I will say FY19 and FY20 we had significant support by each of the colleges because they could do outreach to benefit their programs, their students, yeah. their parent funds. So with that support, we've been able to generate some of these outstanding results. Well, that's, that's absolutely tremendous. Um, so I want to talk a bit more about the planning. So I, I've got up here a, a, a little a little recap of of how you how you plan, and it would be great if you could sort of talk us through, you know, how you go about um, reviewing your results and evaluating what worked and what didn't work the year before, and so on. Well, our process begins at the end of a Giving Tuesday event in terms of the day and results come in in January, once everything has been processed through the system, mm -hmm. we sit down with all of the individual campus partners and support groups and critique ourselves. What worked, what didn't, and what new ideas do we have? And I will say, we on Giving Tuesday, look at other institutions and what they're doing so we can get new ideas. Put, we document everything so that when we plan for an upcoming year, we begin by looking at the review to refresh our memory and then start mm -hmm. breaking it down as to what improvements do we want to make? What do we want to discontinue doing? And have those early conversations with potential donors or partners on campus. Um, with that, in the past, we started in um, August, September. This year, we started conversations in May and June. So we've already put together an overview, looking at the challenges that we are going to be facing with students not being on campus, mm -hmm. the social situation with the pandemic. We're already saying our key to success will be flexibility and creativity, even if it's on the fly because something changes overnight. So at this point, we are now going to be um, reaching out to campus partners within the colleges. And I'll tell you, it was monumental be, to be sitting in a room with over 60 individuals representing each of our seven campus uh, partners, who media people, annual giving representatives, and other individuals in their advancement team, and discussing plans and what everybody needed because we supplied tools but then there were different things that people needed, so we had to be responsive. We work together on the day and hopefully deliver great results 
which we have in the past and we plan to this year. Yes, so that's a bit of a logistical issue in itself, isn't it? How to engage with all of those 60 people when you're not on campus. <laughs> well, this year, thankfully, we have Zoom and everyone is becoming very... <laughs> So continue it's still with Zoom calls. That's it. We're going to continue with the strong support we get by putting together toolkits that include the plans, assets that they could use, graphic assets, informational messaging, other tools to make it as easy as possible, including samples of social media, samples of email communications. Mm -hmm. They adapt, they can be creative because they know their potential donors better than anybody else does. Yeah. So we deliver a framework and then let them get creative. That's perfect. And I think what I've got next is, oh yeah, some examples of this lovely branding and messaging. So one of the first things that I noticed about this is um, the Scotty dog. Um, and then after that, I noticed that, you know, you've taken the Giving Tuesday heart and you've branded it in tartan, which is Carnegie Mellon tartan, isn't it? Yes, it is. And that design started about five years ago and is considered by all of our constituents to be so effective to the point mm -hmm. print stickers and as people make gifts on campus, we would give them a sticker of the plaid heart to wear for the day. Yes. That's evidence that um, made a gift. And, and because, because Scottishness and tartan and the Scottish identity is, is really something, I wonder if you could say a bit about how, you know, that, what that means at Carnegie Mellon. Well, we are the tartans and historically mm -hmm. had our tartan plaid we were able to adapt it into this contemporary look by pulling all the individual colors out so that suddenly so that well. belonged to CMU. No one else could do what we were doing there. And mm -hmm. the Scotty dog is one of the few traditions that reach across our entire campus. Scotty dogs are strong, determined individuals very intelligent, and that sort of captures the spirit of what our students and our whole global community are all about. I will yeah. say that the piece on the left was actually a direct mail piece, and it was a part of our campaign that we sent out to alumni who would relate very quickly to it, and we asked them to take a selfie with the Scotty and post it on our site. And so it's been, it was a lot of fun and a lot of good positive engagement where people started getting involved and then made their gift. You can see we carried the heart into everything because the piece on the right was um, a piece that we used on headers for email, social media, crowdfunding. Everything was adapted for that day, no longer just the CMU um, logo, but rather the Giving CMU Day logo. And it worked, mm -hmm. people loved it. It's, it's great. And um, what I love about it is the fact that it relies on nothing more than color. You see those colors and you instantly know what it is, what it's all about. Um, I, I love the fact that you've also used the direct mail on the uh, selfie. I presume that's something that you'd be able to carry on this year particularly this year when people are feeling, you know, disconnected from campus. Yeah, in the past two years, we had this Scotty plus another version just to spice it up. And um, we're now in discussions of what would be appropriate for this year, by all means. Yeah, absolutely. And so then, you know, moving on from there, we go, we go to the challenges. So, can I ask, how many challenges would you typically run on a Giving Tuesday? What have you I found so. the optimum number? Well, I don't know if we found the optimum because <laughs> this past year, what became very strong was the colleges putting out their own challenges. So it wasn't just a central challenge like from the office of the president offering students a match 
or parents being offered a match. Or importantly, this past year, we had faculty staff who received a challenge. And people stepped up. We saw significant growth in each of the segments that were offered challenges. Last year, I think we had 16 challenges if we count some of the college challenges. This mm -hmm. we're anticipating more because we see how much of a motivation this can be. That's great. And the colleges, are, are they getting that challenge money from their own budget or are they using it as a way of engaging major donors? It is a mix. And it's not just dollars. It's interesting because some of the colleges like engineering in the past have stepped up and said of if a certain level is achieved, they will do a random drawing of all of the student donors, for example, and they will receive mm -hmm. dinner for 10 from a local restaurant. So we try to find something that's significant and exciting to the exact mm -hmm. audience. Um, another example is the faculty staff. Um, last year, or about a year and a half ago, CMU created a food pantry for students. So for the faculty student match, what we had was achieving a certain number of donors to unlock a $5,000 gift to the food pantry. And we exceeded our goal. That's great. Yeah. And, and, you, and you have a, a whole series of emails, don't you, going through the day to alert people to the challenges that need help? We have a strong communications plan that I think is working effectively, uh, but yet we've already talked about some improvements. Um, we do a save the date email, plus the Scotty was a direct mail piece. We have emails going out that include video in the past. Some worked, some didn't. But what we do is as we get closer to the day, we send them with more frequency. And of course, people were not on campus um, and people were busy with the Thanksgiving holiday, but that weekend was pivotal because things had quieted down, people were returning to campus, people were spending time on their um, uh, uh, laptops looking at their emails. So we mm -hmm. sent out a series of them. And yes, we invited students to Plaid Palooza, the midnight party. Mm -hmm. uh, a day in advance, we had uh, videos going out talking about the challenges and we've had lists and individual information going out that the challenges would exist. So there it was a very comprehensive plan that included social media and will again undoubtedly be very strong in social media. Um, and here we've got Plaid Palooza, that's the, um, the centerpiece event. <laughs> well, actually, this um, was at Plaid Palooza, and it was so intriguing to get people and the students engaged that we put it out in the hallway at different tabling events. So we had the spin the wheel, you could win a prize, which was a little trinket, a keychain, or something of that sort. But it gave us time to have the conversation with the potential donor mm -hmm. as to why did we have Giving Tuesday, how they could be benefiting, and the impact that they could have for the university. So we had balloons, we had signage. Um, at Plaid Palooza, the big hit was food, of course. Food is always important. Of course. Um, we even, um, some of the colleges like the Tepper School of Business, they had a location where people could come and get a cup of coffee some popcorn and have those conversations as they were getting these items. And it's been wonderful, the types of response that we've got. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, I'm just going to try and then we've talked about the social and email and here's just a little sampling of the, uh, of the social engagement around it. So, so, of course, that's been up until now. And so I guess, you know, the question now that everybody's thinking is, you know, what next? You know, what, what do you do? 
when you can't have students at a mass event on campus? You know, could you talk us through some of the sort of things that you've been thinking about and discussing? Yeah, um, you're, you're so right. Things are going to be very dynamically different this year. So things like I've mentioned Plaid Palooza, the students are not going to be on campus. Faculty and staff will not be on campus. When they go home at Thanksgiving, they're going to be staying home. So our conversations right now are talking about virtual events. Um, mm -hmm. And you had a very successful uh, event in the spring, which is our traditional carnival that very quickly converted from being on campus to being virtual. And they did a series of different initiatives, such as lectures, presentations, games, tours of different things, historical videos, and we had some really good attendance at these virtual. That's events. fantastic. So mm -hmm. we've gone back to these individuals who did the planning to talk about one, what did they do? What lessons learned did they gain? Trying to piggyback on their success. And we're starting to come up with some ideas to get different constituents involved. We also are looking at some new um, tactics that we have begun to use over the past year, such as texting or video. Mm -hmm. And we're anticipating blending this in where it's appropriate with an appropriate frequency because we don't want a wear out factor. We want people to be excited and looking forward to see what the final results will be. Um, other things that we're considering is the structure of our challenges. And so I must say we are putting a critical eye to everything that we have done historically to see what can we translate? What can we do to engage the donor to make that gift? And the key is impact. We are really I was just gonna say. Yeah. Prior to this day, we have a special impact email that will be going out impact stories on social media, impact information that's going to be on our alumni site. Um, we want people to know what this value is that they are delivering to the university. Um, we try and make it as accurate and truly emotional at times as possible. We want people to stop, pause, and look at what does CMU do for the world for their students, and what is our need, so that they can be part of the solution, part of the support. So impact is so important. Yes, now, absolutely. I, I will add one other thing. The day after, because of the time difference to the West Coast, and let me say we've gotten down to doing emails based on time zones. Um, so mm. trying to get as granular as possible. Um, so we are meaningful to people at the time that they're available. But the day after we do issue an email that acknowledges the final success in terms of all the gifts that are counted at that point in time at the end of the day and the impact that it's had on our students. And it's great the, the open rates and so forth that we have for that email. Mm -hmm. And have you thought about, um, you know, uh, frequency of messaging that you might be doing this year? Because um, what have you seen as your frequency of messaging has gone up over the last couple of years? Have you, have it noticeably impacted things like unsubscribe rates or anything like that? I'm happy to say we haven't had an issue with unsubscribe rates. And we monitor because in the past years, the entire team, which was about 15 people, would be in one room monitoring the results coming in, including the response to emails. Our writer it would be in the room. And although we would have a pre-drafted email, we could adapt it based on the responses that we're seeing. So we tried to be as um, flexible as possible to be able to deliver things mm -hmm. appropriately and optimize what we were doing. We have a full day of emails that go out. Uh, in the past, because we were on campus, we did Facebook Live. So we were able to go to different locations, showing the activities. 
We were able to go to student organizations like some of the dance groups or um, some of the other uh, student organizations to be able to show what they do or talk about mm -hmm. the impact they had as a result of the previous year gifts from Giving Tuesday. We're not going to be able to do that as easily as we have in the past. So our discussions right now are focusing, how do we transfer? How do we make it virtual, meaningful, and appropriate? Because we want people to be interested, but we don't want the wear out factor. Absolutely, yes. That's great. So um, we've got a couple, uh, a couple of minutes to, um, to take some questions. So uh, there was a question here that said, do you think any of your emails going out the weekend before got lost amongst all the Cyber Monday emails people are receiving? They may have, but let me say we do diligent work on our subject lines. We have been able to do A-B testing throughout the year, and we think we're doing the best job possible to attract the attention of the recipient. And some of them may yeah. get lost, but I think people are spending more time on their computer in that weekend before. So given the response rates, I think we're doing fine. Perfect. Um, and somebody here is, has asked a question saying, um, what's your thinking on uh, campuses using a random date for their giving day or piggybacking on Giving Day 2020 along with so many other nonprofits? I think this is a question of, you know, do you think that this year it's going to be challenging uh, because, because of what's been going on in the environment for nonprofits as a whole? It is going to be challenging, but I will say looking back on past years, some campus, uh, some institutions did Giving Tuesday, but they didn't push it. They didn't market mm -hmm. it or promote it as strongly as we do. And then they did a Giving Day in the spring. Um, from what I hear, there were quite a few successful Giving Days this past spring, in spite of the pandemic, in spite of moving campus dates. Um, I think it's the amount of marketing and promotion that an institution puts into place and the support that they get from their partners to help promote the various constituencies. Giving Tuesday now ended up um, being uh, promoted uh, in early May or March rather, or excuse me, in um, the spring when the Giving Tuesday organization realized there was a need out there. And very yeah. quickly, people stepped up. We were one of them that did it for our colleges, and it, it was good response rate for how quickly we mm -hmm. had to develop something. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great because it gives you an immediate impact story to lead into Giving Tuesday proper really in does. December. Well, that's wonderful. Well, um, Marianne, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk to us all. I can see that questions have been coming in as we've been talking. There are a lot of people um, who, who are very interested and want to know more. Um, we won't be able to answer any more questions in this webinar, um, but we will be taking the questions and responding them, to them all afterwards. Uh, so do look out for a blog post on the GGNA website uh, in, in a short in a period of time uh, that will have the answers to the questions everybody asked. Um, so Marianne, I mean, I just want to say again, thanks so much and uh, wishing you the very best of luck for December 2020. Well, thank you, Adrian, again. We thank you for the opportunity to share our story. We don't have all the answers, as you said at the beginning, but we're looking forward to developing some new things that would be appropriate and hopefully successful for this year. And we're looking at our peers as everyone else is. So if there's good stories, please everyone share. Brilliant. Thanks so much. And thanks everybody for um, taking the time to, to attend. I hope you found it useful and 
those are my contact details if you'd like to reach out with any questions.